Hello everyone and welcome to the One Stop Co-op Shop. This is Colin and today we are going to do a playthrough-ish of uh, Artisans of Splendent Vale. This is a campaign game where you're going to choose one of the four characters. Well, you can choose up to four if you're playing four players. And you're going to go through this entire book. Do you see this book? And do uh, somewhat choose your own adventure as well as have some action scenes that are on one of these really cool books where you have all the different maps that you go into. And so what I'm going to do today, I'm actually playing through this with my wife, so I don't want to spoil too much. We're going to walk through setting up two characters, the two that we're not using, and then we'll go through uh, one day, which will give us an action scene and then some of the specific adventures you can find within the books, just so you can see and see if it's something you'd like to pick up. Now, as always, don't forget to turn on those cling on subtitles in case I miss any errors uh, in editing. I will put them up there so people can see them. So without further ado, we're going to set up our two characters. We're playing Farah and we're going to play Romani. Those are the two that my wife and I aren't playing. <laughs> so we're going to use these two. Let's jump in to set up. One of the first things you'll want to do is pull out the map for Splendent Vale. Now, when we are playing this in this video, I'm going to be putting little sticky notes where you are going to be required or recommended to write things down on here because, of course, I don't want to impact this. And that's what I've done with my wife. So I could take them off for this playthrough. We also have the backside of this map, and this is our adventure log where we will be told to write certain things down depending upon what we choose. And we'll go through these days. At the end of each day, it'll tell you to read a specific uh, section in your book. Uh, and, but this will be how you track things that you do each day. And then as the campaign progresses, you will refer back to what you have on here. And depending on what you have, you may have different choices come up. On the back side of each player's book, you will have a little bit about your character and you can read all four to make your determinations of which ones you want to play. Uh, here, Farah is a tailor and we have Romani is uh, an apothecary. So that gives you a little bit about the type of characters that they are. In the front of the book, they have a personal setup. So you can see I start the campaign with a long staff card. I'll show you that in a second. I also have a unique passive ability that's available to me called warm up. This action is shown on the action scene section of my character sheet. We'll see that in a second. I start the campaign with some tailoring components that I can use for crafting later. I add one cotton and one silk to the component list on my character sheet. Next, I will prepare my interlude deck. I take cards 920 through 927, set them aside, shuffle all but 920 together and put 920 on top. And then when I'm not using them, such as between game sessions, I can store them and cards in my character box. Now, one thing I don't love about this game, uh, these books are really hard to hold open. So recording is going to be a little bit of a pain. I'm going to have to hold the book like this and hold the page open. So apologies for that. This will just give you a little bit of an example or uh, information on what we're doing in the game. We are artisans, those who design and create magical items for the citizens of Splendent Vale. Our crafts are demanding both of our time and resources, and for this reason, artisans like us choose to adventure. We travel the length of the Vale, exploring the ruins left behind by our ancestors and reclaiming the knowledge and resources that would otherwise be lost to time. So that's what you're going to be doing during the scenarios. Each scenario, you're just going to be kind of going through them. You're not going to know how to win or lose. You're just trying to progress through them as a best you can. Here we have Farah's character sheet. We also have Farah's meeple. <laughs> I love the meeples. There's 60 some meeples in here. They all look awesome and are unique. It's cool. Uh, inside of here, you have every character has a unique way of leveling up. This is so cool. So as you gain experience, you can go outwards from here. And once you fill in one of these big boxes, you can gain these specific skills like kick, parkour, dodge. Wow, that's cool. Also, I have no idea what that's for. Uh, I guess we'll find out. <laughs> well, we probably won't in this playthrough, uh, but if you play this, you will. On the back side over here, you have components, the different components. And remember, we start with one cotton and one silk, so I have that marked here on a sticky note. <laughs> and then on the back side here, when we do an action scene, so think of that being... Well, the one that we're going to do in this uh, playthrough will be a, a fight scene. When we do that, these are the actions that are going to be available to us, and we'll see how that works in the playthrough. We start with one item. It's the long staff, the two-handed weapon. We can thwap with it, and it does an attack two 
Uh, we get to roll a die for potential critical hits, and it has reach, so we can actually attack two away from ourselves instead of just adjacent to ourselves. And what's really cool is the character that my wife's playing, which is Soraya, she can actually level these up. Now, I have no idea if that can still happen if she's not playing. I don't know, but I do think it's cool that every one of the items has a way of enchanting or leveling it up. I'm assuming that you can still do that even when she's not playing. Romani will start with the Slingshot, that's card 45. She also has a unique passive ab ability available to her called Underfoot. This ability is shown in the action scene selection of her sheet. Other actions there, move, punch, are available to everyone, just like uh, everyone else. I start the campaign with some alchemical ingredients that I can use for brewing later. I add two wormroot and one pickleberry to the ingredient shelf on my character sheet. Uh, sheet. <laughs> one type of potion I can brew is called a stamina tonic. We take card 106 from the index for the team to use as a reminder of what a stamina tonic does. The team starts the campaign with three of them. We deci decide how to split them up now and have these players record them in their potion section of the character sheets. Potions can be traded or given away as needed. Next, I prepare my interlude deck. I take cards 940 through 947. Take 940, set it aside, shuffle the other ones, and put that on top. I'll show you how that works at the end of the video because you won't do that until the end of the day, uh, but you will set it up now. Here we have the character sheet for Romani and her small little meeple. She is considered small, so she can actually share the, a space with another character, including enemies. Uh, I think that might come into play. I don't know. I've never played her. I've never played Farah. We're just going to experience them together. <laughs> uh, inside of here, oh, first, we have uh, the three tonics. I just gave it to her to make it easy. Her leveling up looks super cool. I have no idea how all that works. Well, I think it's the same way. When you use experience, you're going to go outwards from here. And then once you fill in these boxes, or I should say circles, you'll be able to gain, gain those abilities. We also start with some different uh, um, ingredients so we can create potions. And that one potion that we have right now is the stamina tonic. Uh, and we'll see that in a second. We have one unique passive ability. It says underfoot. Because I'm small, I can occupy a space with an ally or enemy. I treat enemy spaces as difficult terrain. Some abilities grant you passive ability. So that's what underfoot means. We have three of these stamina tonics. It's a regen one self. And then you get to add two dice to the pool. You'll see what that means. We also have our slingshot, which allows us to attack two and add a die for potential crits at a range three. And just like all the other ones, you can have crafting and level this up, which is cool. <laughs> I love how you're able to do that. The interlude cards for your characters will look like this. And remember, I have a specific one on top. The other ones are random because they want you to end the day a specific way for your first day. So I've set those up for both characters. That's it. That's all you got to do to set up the game. What you're going to do now is open your books. And if you were playing this two players, so when I'm playing with my wife, we both open our books uh, and we go to the same spot. So we're going to go. And what they have here, if, if you want a little more flavor, you can actually read here about how your character knows the other characters in the game. So if I wanted to know how Farah uh, met Romani or uh, you know how they interact, I can do that here. But what we will do is we'll start reading from one. And what's really cool is that everyone has the same one here. So we can all read along in the same book, uh, in different books. But there are certain areas, and you'll see one here, where specific characters have interjections. So Soraya, if my wife was playing, and she's playing Soraya, if she was looking at her book, right after we finished reading this, she would then read something that's only in her book, not in mine. Now, when we do our playthrough now, we'll skip that because she's not here with us. But when we get to here, Harinya does have something to say, and so we'll jump to her book and read what she has to say. Kind of cool how they did that. So let's go ahead and just start reading. The sun is only just beginning to break up the morning fog on the bay when we set off into the heart of the Vale. The destination for today's adventure is the ruins of Karimi Library. The meteor shower that forced the building to be abandoned apparently left the ruins mostly intact. Others have probed the area in the past, but we're quite sure there is still more to be reclaimed here. Now Sarai isn't here, so we'll just skip that and keep moving. The journey is time-consuming, but not particularly difficult. We follow along the Crimson River until the sun has risen high in the sky. We come to a steep cliff where the river cascades from above and shimmering colors play in the misty air. At the top of the winding path, we see the stone brick turrets of the library. 
Nice, I exclaim. I can see it right up there. We made pretty good time. I skip ahead up the rocky slope, stopping only briefly to say hello to a butterfly fleet feeding on a stand of bright flowers. As we crest to the top of the rise and approach the library's courtyard, we see a group of rough-looking fellows gathered in front of the buildings, prodding at the door and windows. Do we have company for today's adventure? We wonder to ourselves. As we get a bit closer, I take note of the clothing they're wearing. Their styles aren't common in the Vale, I point out. They remind me more of the styles I've seen from across the sea. Possibly they're not from the Vale. We come into earshot and hear them discussing the best way to break into the building. Oh no. The door won't budge. We'll have to knock it down, says a stout burly man. Don't be stupid, retorts a slender fellow with curved horns. It should be far easier to boost each other through a window. A tall, roguish woman with sharp features notices our approach and points the curved blade of her polearm in our direction. Look sharp, she calls out. We have friends. Her lip curls into a sinister smirk as she pronounces the last words. So Javi is in here, we'll skip by. The strangers draw sabers and crossbows. The woman with the polearm, presumably their leader, calls out to us. You'll have to find another tomb to rob. This one is ours. So now what we would do is record on our adventure log under the current day, the 27th under the twins, that bandits were trying to break into uh, Karimi Library. Now I'm not going to do that right now because I don't want to write on there, but that's what we would do. Then how will we respond? Now, each character has a different response here, and we can choose which one we want to do. Uh, the only two that we have as options are these two, and we'll have to go to the specific book. Since I'm here, I'm going to do That's No Tome. So now I, and only I, can read 127. I sigh. That is no tomb, and it's certainly not yours to ransack. The woman narrows her eyes at me, but doesn't immediately respond, so I continue. This place is part of our history, and we kindly ask you to leave peacefully. A few of the bandits chuckle at this. Their leader smiles and silences them with a wave of a hand. What difference is it to us if it's part of your history? I can hear the sneer in her voice as she continues. Either we loot it or you do. Personally, I prefer the version where we get the treasures. I sigh again, knowing already this won't end well. The difference is that we're not stealing and you are. We are merely reclaiming what our people left behind. Hope they see a reason. We read 148. Notice how it said we? That means everyone has this in their book, so everyone can turn to 148 and read along. That's quite enough of that, sneers the woman as she brandishes her fockard in your direction. The other bandits motion threateningly with their sabers and crossbows. Kill them, the leader mutters with no remorse. Then she brings two fingers to her lips and releases a shrill whistle. As the bandits advance on us, we hear the barking of dogs from the woods to the west. Take the fight to the bandits before reinforcements arrive. We play Rune Raiders on page 2 and 3 of the action scene book. We're now going to move to the tactical portion of the game, which is quite fun. I will say it reminds me quite a bit of Mice and Mystics, that type of game, but there's a ton of rules. So if I miss any, I apologize. Uh, I do feel like there might be more rules here than they need. I mean, there's pushing, running into things. You can't attack range when you're adjacent to enemies. Small enemies can share spaces with regular enemies. It's just, I, I do feel like they put a lot of rules in here that I don't know if it's super beneficial for the game, but it does mean that these can be very tactical. Let's go ahead and set this one up. To set up this action scene, we need to place one because we're playing two player. If we were playing three player, it'd be two. And if you're playing four player, it'd be two. So we're going to place one ruffian on this symbol. And it says, reminder, place meeple starting with the lowest number on the spaces matching the glyph and number. So here we have the ruffian. And what's really cool is let's say I was putting out two ruffians. This one has a little one here. There's another ruffian with a two and a three and a four. So cool. So it's easy to track which one is which. Then what we're going to do is we're going to place one arbalist uh, because we're playing two players. So it's the farthest left one on this rune. Once again, using the number one version. Okay. And then we're going to place Legia, the uh, raid leader, and she is going to be placed on this moon symbol once again in the one spot. So let's go ahead and set those up. How you know where you place these on the board, you have to find the symbol that matches what we were shown on the other side of the page. So you can see this is the symbol that we had for the raider, and we're supposed to place it in location one because this is the number one raider. So we've placed him here. Legia was supposed to start in the moon space. It's very, very faint, but you can see there's a moon there. And then the arbalist is supposed to be placed in a location with that symbol or that glyph. And there's a one here, so we're going to place this here. 
We now can place our characters in any of the spaces with paw prints. Normally, we'd have to be in different spaces, but remember, uh, we have a small character, so she can join, so we might as well join together here. We have a reinforcement rule here. At the end of the first round, place one arbalist on one of these symbols and one gnarling curs on one of these symbols. Then we read 180 in our books. Our goal is when Legia and two others are defeated, we read 46 in our books. They have some nice reminders over here. It costs one extra movement to move out of a space of difficult terrain. That's slightly different than a lot of other games where it's two to move in. This one, it's two to move out. Uh, and that would include the water, rubble, bushes. I'll show you those in a second. A unit can't move into impassable terrain, such as the broken fountain or statues. And small units like Harinya or the Arbalist can occupy the same space as another unit, and enemy space counts as difficult terrain. Currently, we have a Ruffian out with a total of six health. So I have a tracker here, and I'll set this on, well, but I'll just put it right on top of here. This is how the Ruffian will act when it's the Ruffian's turn, so we'll look at that in a second. The Arbalist have five health, so we'll set a tracker to five and put that here. Legia has a total of four times the amount of players, so that's eight, so eight total health. Next, we would choose which weapons we're going to bring into combat and all of that, but right now that's very simple. We each have only, only have one. <laughs> uh, and we have our potions right now. All of them are with Romani, and we can see all the different actions we can take during the game, uh, during the action scene. Move, punch, ready. We have reactions. Reactions are once per turn, so that's even an enemy's turn. You can use a reaction. Of course, that's how you can defend. And then we have a passive ability, which we already saw. Two more pieces of setup and we're ready to start. We have an initiative marker here. Now, anyone that could possibly be on the board is on this initiative track. But since we're only playing with two players, we're never going to see a third arbalist or a number two uh, bandit. So we're just gonna slide right by those. Same with Soraya and Ferris. We're not going to see them either, or Ferial, because they're not in the game. So if they're not on the board, we just move by, but this tells us the initiative order. And I love that. I love how cool that is. You can also see Legia is uh, an elite enemy and so that means she will activate twice in one round Ooh, we got to watch that actually we are lucky uh, that farah gets to activate first but we haven't talked about how we activate and that's the last part of setup we have dice we are going to have eight dice in a pool and then we at the beginning of our turn can roll three new dice into the pool and then we can use dice to perform up to two actions so that's three plus another three that's six plus two more is eight. So I'm gonna pick up all eight of these and give them a little roll. And these are going to uh, give us the different actions that we can take. Wow, I have a lot of boosts and some good punches. That's a wild symbol. So wild, a boost, moving. This is a power, a punch symbol. Yeah, and that's all the ones that I see. I see no shields at all, which is a bit of a bummer actually. Looking at the initiative track, we're actually going to be able to activate before any of the enemies, both of us, kind of nice. And actually somewhat not nice, because then we're just going to get hammered for a while. Oh, I didn't even tell you what our toughness is. I'll show you that in a second. But on your turn, what you're going to do is add three dice to the pool, roll them in, and then perform up to two actions by spending dice from the pool. Farah's toughness is six, and Romani's toughness is also six. Because Farah is first, we'll roll in three more dice. Okay, good. There's a shield at least. A shield, a wild symbol, and a boot. Currently, we have 11 dice we can play with. Well, the first thing we're going to do is try and move. In order to move, you can see we need to use a boot die. So I'm going to exhaust this die to be able to move two. Now, if I really wanted to move three, I could use a boost die as well and exhaust that boot die. And then any number that's underlined, as well as any dice that show on the action itself, are, are increased by one. So I'd get to be able to move three with this one, and this one I could attack three and roll two dice, which is kind of cool. But right now, all I'm doing is simply moving two. Farah can move two spaces, one, two. Now you can see these areas with the dotted blue lines, those are difficult terrain spaces. Remember moving into them, no problem. Moving out costs two. These white spaces here, that are the white outline, I should say, that means that's impassable. You can't shoot through that, so you can't count spaces through that. There, there is no essentially line of sight in this game. The, the difference is, is that you can't shoot through spaces that are impassable, but characters don't block line of sight. My next action, I'm going to attack. I'm going to use my long staff. Now, this is a thwap action, <laughs> so attack two, plus I get to roll a die to see if I crit. 
I crit by when I roll that extra die, if I get the bam or hit symbol or the wild symbol, it gives me plus one damage for that. Now I'm not adjacent and this says attack too, so if it doesn't have a range, it's considered that I need to be adjacent. However, I have reach, so I have an extension or extension of one space. So I can attack with this up to two spaces away, which is why I can hit the Arbalist with this long staff. So right now I'm attacking for two, but I'm boosting. So I'm attacking for three, plus I get to roll two dice, which I might as well just roll these two dice and see if I can get that bam symbol. So I'll roll them up. Ooh, I have a wild symbol. So the wild symbol can be used for any type of symbol. So that will be considered as one crit. So three plus one, I just hit that arbalist for four. And remember the arbalist only has five health. Wow, that was a great hit. So knocking her all the way down to one. Farah's ended her activation. We move to, what is this, the dog or whatnot? Well, the dog isn't on the board yet, so we can pass that and we move right to Romani. It's Romani's turn. She's going to roll in three new dice. We only have four in the non-pool right now. If you don't have enough dice, you would just roll as many as you can. So we'll roll these up. Oh, we got, this one can be used for both symbols, like a boost with the foot, which is nice. You can move for three. I got another shield and a boost symbol. Romani's activation is going to be very simple. We're just going to use the move to move two and then use our bam for our slingshot, which has a range of three. We can attack two. We could roll for a crit, but who cares? Because we're going to take out that Arbalist who only has one health left anyways. We'll have her move up one Two. Remember, we can share spaces because she's small. She uses a slingshot and takes this character out. That's one of the two enemies plus Legia that we need to take out. Now, however, it's Legia's activation and how you determine how they activate. You roll a die and see what they get. Oh, she got a wild symbol. She has a pole and blade. Attack one plus two dice for a crit. And either of these symbols are considered crits for her. And then push one. Well, the advantage is no one's adjacent to her, so she can't do that. She will then move to, which she can move to, and attack to with reach. She'll move two spaces, one, two, and she is within range two, so she is going to attack one of these two for two damage. If ever there's a tie on which character to attack, we always look to see which one is next on the initiative track, so that would be Farah. So right now, this attack is to Farah. It's for two straight damage. Lucky for Farah, Farah has a defend, and she'll use this die to block two, so it takes no damage. We should also roll a die, but once again, the attack's only for two, so I'm not going to roll a die. We just exhaust that. We now have three dice exhausted, and we took no damage from that attack. We can keep moving down the initiative track and the next one to go will be the bandit. So let's roll the die up. Oh, he gets a bam. He's going to stand and fight. He must be fighting some sort of fish in the water <laughs> because no one's adjacent to him. So he can't attack, but he will protect himself. So he's going to gain the status of protection. That will cancel one point of damage that he will take each uh, time he's attacked until the end of his next turn how these conditions work. Unlike most games, you can actually gain multiple of the same conditions. And then at the end of the turn, after which you've gained it, you will discard one of them. So he could have protect three, and then after one turn that he takes, he'll go down to two, and then goes down to one. Bleed is a little bit different. Uh, if you have up to four of them, you'll actually take two damage and discard two of them. Otherwise, you normally just take one damage and then discard one of them. But this, what we'll do is we'll actually place it on the initiative track so we know which of the bandits are protected. Right now, there's only one bandit on the board, so it's pretty simple, but we'll just put it here. That way, at the end of his next turn, we'll simply discard this. Uh, we have no three Arbalist. Uh, we, uh, this character isn't in the game. We defeated this one. There's no level two bandit. Uh, so the last one to go, which you just can't see here, is Legia. It's going to activate again. So let's roll her die up. Oh, she gets a bam. She's going to do a blade sweep. This is just mean. She's going to move two. She can definitely move to attack one plus a die. She technically has reach. Uh, let's see what she gets. She gets a bam. So she's going to attack for two. And this area of effect makes me think she's going to hit both of our characters. Ow. So I do think both of us, the advantage is, is it's only for two damage. We are going to exhaust both of these dice because both of us have a defend that's a block for two. And that'd be for the two damage. Remember, that's a wild. So we can use that and we can use it once per turn. But now we've exhausted five dice because of that. But we won't take any damage from that attack. 
she'll move herself right up to here, and then she does that area of effect attack. We've completed round one, now we have to do the reinforcements. We need to place an arbalist, and we'll place that arbalist right back here, the level one, and one of these gnarly dogs, and that's going to be right here. Ugh. So we have two new enemies, and now we have to read 180 in our books. A barking hound bursts from the undergrowth of the western woods, followed closely by another bandit wielding a crossbow. Aww, I exclaim, trying to get a closer look. What a cute puppo friend. Who's a good puppo? Immediately, the canine charges at us, snarling and bearing vicious teeth and horns. The arbalist loads their weapon and takes aim. I squeak and duck behind the nearest cover. Okay, not a friendly puppo. Very angry puppo. Action scene continues. Farah is somehow still faster than that dog, so she will activate first, rolling in three dice. Oh, great, we did get a bam. So the first thing we're going to do is use a bam with this. That allows us to use our long staff, attacking for three and rolling for two additional crits. We're hoping for bams or wilds if we can. That's two bams. So three plus two, that's five damage. Ligia only has eight health, so that'll put her down to three health remaining. You can only perform one single attack action per turn. So our second action, we're going to ready. We have to spend a die from the pool, but then we can change it to any of these four symbols. I'm going to change it to a bam so we can help Romani. Next, the gnarling cur will activate. We'll roll our die in. We have a boost symbol. The boost is chase down, move three, attack one, rolling two dice, can get any of these symbols for additional damage, and threaten. So if they attack, they would actually reduce the amount of damage that we would do for our next turn. Fortunately for us, that gnarling cur one, two, three is too far away to attack, so no problems there. Okay, now it's Romani's turn. We have seven dice in the pool. Let's roll three more up. Oh, I like the shields. That's nice. Well, to start with, we're boosting our attack. Our attack is then three plus whatever we roll, but we're just going to take out Legia right here. Wow, we did not take out Legia that fast, my wife and I, <laughs> but she only had three health. Doesn't matter what we roll with these. That will take them out with the slingshot. Legia is no more. Then I think we're going to use this with a boosted walk. So normally we can move two, but that will allow us to move up to three spaces. We'll remove Legia from this space, and then I think we'll just simply move up one. All we have to do is get rid of this Arbalist, and that would mean we've removed two of her ruffians plus Legia herself, and that would mean we could end this scene. So I think... I think that's it for us. We were able to take Legia out so we can skip that. There is no level uh, number two gnarling cur, so it's just going to be the bandit or the ruffian, I should say, rolling up, getting the boost symbol. This will just be an advance, move two, and attack two. It takes two movement to get out of the water, so he's simply just going to move here. That's all he can do. He'll then discard this protection condition, and then the only enemy that has not gone yet is the arbalist. Let's just roll up and see what we get. We get a, a boost symbol as well. We have a move to attack one plus one range three. So let's see, is it an attack two? Uh, yes, it is. It's an attack two range three. It's going for Romani. So Romani will use this shield to block the damage as a reaction. Awesome. No problems there. But the only thing I'm not sure is if it would move away. I'm going to say it will move away because it makes it harder. Arbalist will move two away. One, two, and still within range three to attack. Okay, that's the end of that round. We'll move back to Farah's turn. We'll roll in the three action dice. Wow, that is cool. Whenever she rolls as a passive once per turn, after you add one of these to the pool, we get to move one. So we're going to be able to move one. Plus, we'll use this for a total movement of three. Plus, we will then use these two to be able to do a boosted attack for a total of three plus two dice. Our two dice roll will deal plus one damage. That, meant, that means we dealt four damage, one away from taking that Arbalist out. We were able to move three spaces. One, two, three. We can then attack, dealing five or four damage. That Arbalist only has one health. Okay, the Kerr is next. We'll roll this up. That is a boost symbol. With the boost, he's going to move three and try and attack. One, two, three. Still can't attack. And then we all know it's going to be Romani's turn. She's going to roll these three up. Oh, yeah. 
she's going to use this as a burst with three movement, one, two, and then she can use this uh, die to just do a basic attack of two, punch this thing in the face, it's gone. <laughs> Yeah, so it's it's the first one. It's relatively easy, but it just kind of shows you how the action uh, scene works. When Legia and two others are defeated, read 46 in our books. With the final strike, we send the bandit leader staggering through the shallow water. She glares at us through a stream of blood that runs down one side of her face. He'll regret this, she spits. Then she whistles, turns tail, and flees into the wilds to the west. The other bandits and hounds limp after throwing curses and rocks in our direction. In their haste to retreat, one of them stumbles and fails to notice the glass vials that slip from his belt pouch. Despite our having scared them away, there are too many to easily track down and capture, but at least they've abandoned their attempt to loot the library. So we have here this action scene is over, record in our adventure log that the bandits fled to the woods, we gain two healing potions, uh, and we each gain three experience, then read three. With the threat removed, we could take our time exploring the library ourselves. Still, it might be wise to go after the bandits right away, even if we can't capture all of them. Those we do capture can tell us where they came from and what they plan to do. One way or the other, we're in this together. Let's consider our options and decide what to do next as a team. So we can either chase down the bandits before they get too far, or we can let the bandits go for now and search the library. We're going to do this one. We'd add the library 279 to the map at D3, and we read 279. So we would write that on the map, but I'm not going to do that because I'm doing my own playthrough with my wife. Uh, but you'd actually mark that in space D3 and then go to 279. On the map, we can see D is here and 3 is here. So we would place that um, library right here, and that's where we would write it. Rather than pursue the bandits, we attend to our wounds and look over the library's overgrown exterior. The bandits are a threat that will have to wait for another day to be answered. Record on our adventure log that we left the bandits escape for now and then add bandits trail to the map at C3. After a short rest and some snacks, we decide we're ready to continue our adventure for the day. We read 194. The cracked stone facade of one iconic building has been reclaimed by swaths of moss and creeping vines. Anywhere else in the world, one would assume this building had been abandoned for more than a decade. But here in the Vale, the plants grow more aggressively. It has only been a few months since the meteor struck the library. The Karimi Library was built with the rolling masonry doors that are common in large public buildings. The mechanism is simple enough. The door is a heavy disc of hewn stone set into a masonry frame. Pressing against the door causes the slab to shift forward and roll to the side. Ugh, why are these doors so popular? Whoever made them did not have us small folks in mind. They're too heavy. I have to lean my whole weight into them, and then tall folks look at me like I'm weak. I run my fingers along the stone frame. Nature has started to reclaim this place. There are vines between the stones, carving a home for themselves. Within a couple more months, these walls will be more botany than masonry. Perhaps the bandits were expecting this style of door. But to be fair, we do have to press against the door particularly hard before it opens with the grinding of smooth stone. We read 277. We step into the main hall, careful to avoid small piles of open books scattered near the entryway. Rows of moss-covered bookshelves have toppled to the stone floor, spreading their contents among the rocks and debris. The floor tiles are ringed with weeds and saplings, while twisting vines hang like window drapes. The entire room is illuminated by dusty rays of light, streaming through a circular hole in the ceiling where a meteor struck. On the floor below, within an impact crater, a large tree grows, enveloped in that ring of light. Oh, look at these books, I exclaim. I wonder if they have any recipe books, for an apothecary, I mean, though I wouldn't say no to a good cookbook either. Certainly, the structure and shape of a library exists here, but the wilds have truly begun to reclaim this place. Lush greenery drapes every surface, and the tree branches reach through the broken windows to drop their seeds inside. It looks more like a forest clearing than a library. We explore map 630. Here we have map 630. So what we can do here is you look for numbers that are on the ground or anywhere that you can see in the actual picture themselves. And then you are supposed to bookmark this page and then you can go to those entries. But what's super cool is that not everyone has the same numbers. Each character might have a specific number that only they can see. So for an example, I see 40 here. But I don't see a 40 in Romani's book. Isn't that cool? So that 40 is specific to Farah, And I definitely did not read a 40 with my wife when I was playing this scenario with the other two characters. 
It's kind of amazing if you ask me. I love how they did that. But there will be some that everyone has. For example, this 232 that's on the tree. I might do a couple of these. I don't want to spoil too much, but I kind of want to show you how these work. So let's do 232 for one example. We come to the edge of the sunlit crater, though certainly destructive. It is small compared to the massive craters that form the veil. The impact of the shattered meteorite has left bits of glimmering crystal buried in the ground or scattered about. A tree some six to eight meters tall had sprung up through the center of the crater with several saplings dotted around the edges. We explore map 47. Here now we have a zoomed up picture of that tree. You can see where the meteorite came through the actual building, causing all the destruction. We have number 258. I definitely did not see that with my wife. I'm going to do one that's specific to a character, and then I think maybe I'll stop this part because I don't want to spoil too much. I just want to show you, though, how this works. So let's go to 258. I follow a trail of droppings until I come upon a family of mice that have been chewing a home for themselves in one of the larger tomes. Hello there, little ones, I coo. I take out a bit of granola I packed for a snack. Within seconds, they're eating out of my hand and letting me give them loving scratches. After they've had their fill, they kindly show me their stashed treasures and allow me to take a vial of red powder as a parting gift. Materia, or red stuff as I like to call it, is a vital component for an apothecary. It's a core ingredient in virtually every alchemical mixture known to modern magica. Its uses change based on the ingredients it's mixed with. Just dissolving it in warm water and adding shavings of a wormwood and dried pickled berries is enough to create a surprisingly potent stamina tonic. Throw in a new tail and it'll cure many common diseases. Cool stuff. Thank the mice and say my goodbyes. I gained three materia. I returned to the bookmarked page. So, because I was the only one that would have seen that number, this is my specific story within that uh, page. And so I would read this, everyone else would listen, I would gain the three materia, and then maybe we'd go and read somebody else's. I think that's enough spoiling of the story for today. Plus, my hands hurt from trying to keep the blasted book open. My goodness, the bindings in these <laughs> are brutal. I'm telling you, it's a huge pain to keep the books open. At some point, it'll tell you to go to the end of the day, and you're going to read. At the end of the day, we read 484 in our books. Heavy clouds roll in off the sea as night falls. Humans and animals alike take shelter as a gentle rain soaks the street. Uh, we each heal one damage. We advance uh, the recovery of each injury. Fortunately, we don't have any of those. The rain has moved on through the veil long before dawn breaks on the harbor. As we rise for a new day, we remind ourselves that not every day needs to be a death-defying adventure. Sometimes just staying home and crafting is good for body and mind. Add stay home to the map and we choose a location on our map to explore. I'm realizing that at some point in the story, it tells you to go to your interlude cards before you read that. So let's just look at one interlude card. This is an interlude card for Pharaoh. It says, as I return home, I take a second to ground myself in the familiar surroundings. Despite the action-packed day, I'm still able to climb the 10 stories to my apartment with ease. Then we each read our own interludes. So we cool down for the day. I read 920 in my book. After reading that, then we archive this card. And then next, the next time we have an interlude, we'll flip one of these and it will be one of those random six cards. And I'm assuming we'll add some more into it as we play. There you have it. That was Artisans of Splendid Veil, a very enjoyable game. I love how the books work. I think the action scenes are cool. I need to do more to see if I feel like the time spent with all the rules makes it worth it. But I do love how the dice pool works. I think the dice pool is really cool. You have that shared dice pool and you're using the uh, symbols on there to do your actions. I think that's awesome. The story writing is solid. The characters are all very unique and fun to learn about. Just know that it is a campaign game. Once you pick a character, you're with them for the entire thing. I don't know how many sessions you're going to get out of it. It is definitely a legacy type game. After you play it, you'll need a recharge pack if you want to play it again. But I do think there is some replayability in here if you're not playing with all four characters at least. Uh, but you can always play through it and then get a recharge pack and sell it to somebody. So that is cool. I hope you guys enjoyed this. Thanks so much for watching, for subscribing, for hanging out with us here at the One Stop. We appreciate you all very much. And I hope you'll catch us in one of our next playthroughs. I'll see you at the next stop.